uh, the, the literal translation of Brahma Vihara means divine abiding. They're also called the immeasurable or illimitable states. And some modern uh, commentators have called them the skillful emotions. And I think that's a good, um, good approach. It said that uh, the wise person always dwells in one of the Brahma Viharas. So these are not only the skillful emotions, but really they're the only skillful emotional states, the only ones that are completely uh, blameless and spiritually positive. And these are uh, variations, the first three in particular are variations of um, uh, love or well-wishing, and the fourth is a little different, it transcends the other three. And these are metta, karuna, mudita, and upeka. And the usual English translations are loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. <clears throat> so it's first, uh, first of all important to clarify exactly what these states mean is, um, for one thing the English translations can be a bit misleading metta is the most general one uh, and um, it uh, is a, a feeling of um, benevolence or well wishing and the associated aspiration is may all beings be well and happy. Uh, it's important to understand what this, uh, what this is and what it's not. Uh, for all of these Brahma Viharas, they're only spiritually powerful if they're universal. If you have um, loving kindness for all beings without uh, exception. I had one one guy tell me I can have loving kindness for everything except mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's not that's not good enough. You have to you have to go have to go a bit further. It has to be universal, or it's not really effective. You can't discriminate and say I, I like these kind of beings, but not these kind. It has to be universal. It's also important to understand what it's not. It doesn't mean when you have metta for a being, human being or an animal or whatever, it doesn't mean you uh, like them in the conventional sense or that you want to be around them. You know, it's just may they be well and happy. Uh, an example is when, when I was in Thailand in my early training, I spent my first few years in Thailand and some of it we spent in the in the forest in the, and it's quite a uh, quite a lot of sort of harmful creatures in the forest, scorpions and poison snakes and whatnot. And um, we had a chant that we called, we called it the uh, creepy crawly chant. This is somebody nicknamed it that. It's uh, wishing uh, metta to, uh, and we chanted in Pali, and the translation means something like, I'll just paraphrase it. Um, uh, I send metta to all beings to all kinds of snakes, to all beings with uh, eight legs, with uh, six legs, with four legs, with no legs. May all beings be well and happy, but may they stay far away from me. <laughs> <laughs> so so you're, you're wishing metta. You know, having metta doesn't mean, for the scorpion, doesn't mean you want to pick up the scorpion and cuddle it and take it into your sleeping bag. <laughs> Uh, it means may this being be well and happy. You may enjoy its existence as a scorpion. Okay? Um, so you know that's the first thing about metta. That um, it, it, it has to be a genuine well wishing that you wish that no harm comes to this being. May he be happy. Now that and that's really essentially all that it means. You know each of these four states has what's called a near enemy and a far enemy. The far enemy is the opposite state, the 
it's obviously um, obviously a counter, you know, a completely opposite state of mind. And for Metta, the opposite state is hatred. So if you hate a being, then that's the opposite of Metta. But the near enemy is partial affection, meaning that you know you have a particular fondness for this being, and it's and um, you don't have it's not universal. So you like you have this. So it's, the near enemy of these states is a state that has some quality similar to metta. It could be mistaken for metta, but it's not really. It's something different, right? So uh, that's the uh, near enemy for metta. Karuna is com- translated as compassion, and uh, that translation is not bad, but it's a little bit misleading. What we generally mean by compassion in English, uh, the word compassion in English comes from Latin, and it means to feel with, right? calm passion. And um, karuna is not that, because karuna is the wish may all beings be free from their suffering. Every type of being in the in the world has a, their own unique kind of suffering. No being in existence is free of suffering completely. So you, you wish may all beings be free of suffering. But it doesn't mean that you take on their suffering. Now, this is quite important because this is where people often get go wrong with understanding Karuna. Um, you're wishing that beings be free from suffering, but if it makes you feel suffering yourself, if the carry is suffering, then it's you're not doing it right. You're not feeling genuine karuna. So, so it's a it's a wish that beings be released from their suffering, and it can um, it can be a motivation for action. It's if there's if there's a way you can physically act in the world to relieve somebody's suffering, then karuna might be a motivating factor in that. But in in many cases, and probably most cases, there's nothing you can do, but you still feel karuna. You still have the wish or aspiration. May this being be released from suffering. Uh, the far enemy of karuna is cruelty, which is the wish that to cause suffering. Right? You want the being to suffer. That's a little different than hatred. Hatred is you just you don't want them around, but cruelty, you actually want to make them suffer. So it's, it's kind of worse. And the near enemy is, is pity. You, know, you feel this kind of maudlin, sentimental pity for, for beings. It's not, and then you suffer feel the suffering when you pick it up, you see somebody hurt and it makes you sad, and that's not genuine karuna. It has some overlap. I mean there's some these near enemies have some positive qualities, but they're not perfect. Right? And then Modita is the third one, is um, the complementary opposite of Karuna. Now this is the wish that beings continue to enjoy the good fortune they have attained. Um, and the far enemy is um, uh, envy. You see, you see somebody enjoying good, good fortune, and it makes you feel upset because you know they've got it and you don't. Um, the near enemy is vicarious enjoyment. Right? So you, you know, kind of fantasize about enjoying whatever this person has. And the good fortune is understood in, in just the ordinary way. You know, the example that's given in the Sudimaga is um, if you see somebody riding on a richly caparisoned elephant. Right? So it would be like a modern example would be he's got a, a brand new Lexus. Right? And, you know, and, and if you uh, if you have Envy, like how come he does? I got to be the old Chevrolet. How come he's got? This, <laughs> how come he's got this great car? I know that's you know that's envy. But Modita is feeling, oh, I'm happy. Joe's got a brand new car. That's great. That's that's Modita. You know? 
Um, and uh, the the fine the, and those three, I'll uh, say it because the, the fourth one is a little different than the other. So I'll say some more general things about these three first. Um, these can be developed as meditations, as formal meditations in different ways and there's uh, there's quite a lot of variation but there's two uh, ways that are generally spoken of as, um, and they have a little bit different effect, a little bit different value. Uh, the first way is to do it towards individuals and you develop a, a list in your mind. Uh, you go first to yourself. So if it's mid time, you say, may I be well and happy? Then you extend that to um, a, uh, your parents if they're still alive. And then you extend it to uh, a teacher, then to a good friend, then to a neutral person, and to an enemy. So you're working towards the most difficult one. Um, so you begin, may I be well and happy. And, a way, and there's different, people have different um, abilities, different uh, ways of doing this. And the important thing is that is the feeling, the feeling of metta or karuna or mudita. Um, and whatever means you use to access that is useful. Some people uh, rely on verbal formula. May, may, this, may I be well and happy. May this being be well and happy. May that being be well and happy. Some people prefer visualization. You, you imagine that person and you're radiating metta towards them. But the important thing is you get this feeling going. And it's always very important when you're doing these meditations that, the, that you don't skimp on that first step. It's very important to have metta and karuna and so on towards yourself. Um, you have to feel, you have to develop it towards yourself. If you can't feel genuine metta towards yourself, you cannot have genuine metta towards anyone else. And this is a problem in um, in. Uh, our Western culture. I think a lot of people have very negative self-image, and it's uh, it's very important you you feel good about you know may I be well and happy, just genuine benevolence towards yourself. And if you do, if you have that really strong towards yourself, you can't you cannot stop there, because your own personal being is too small of a vehicle to hold it. And it'll flow out anyway. So you you need to start there. May I be well and happy, and then extend it. Um, and you do it through this list of individuals, you know, so in yourself and your parents. Only if they're still alive. Otherwise, you skip that step. Then a teacher, then um, a good friend, a neutral person, and an enemy. And traditionally, um, when you're picking individuals, you don't you use only individuals that are alive. You don't use beings that are, are are dead. There's other practices you can do to help help the dead. But if the the idea is if they're if they're died and they're in the ghost realm and you are offering the metta, it doesn't help them. It makes them it attracts them to hang around and remain in that ghost state. So you don't don't use dead people, and the other traditional um, caution is don't use it. don't pick an individual that you might develop sexual attraction to, because it can easily turn into lust if you develop your method towards a person. So don't choose someone of the you know, the type, the age, and gender qualities that would attract you sexually. You avoid that. Um, and uh, I have to tell you a little story. There's a, a third category, I think, in modern times. There's one of our monks was at an airport, and he was waiting to get on his flight. And um, the uh, 
security people came through with the, the do sniffer dogs, and he was practicing metta while he was sitting there. He extended metta towards the dog. <laughs> and and uh, metta has an effect of, um, it has an effect, that it actually has an effect on beyond yourself. It affects other beings. So this dog actually came over and, and, and uh, muzzled him. Right. So, <laughs> so the security people, okay, you come. <laughs> so, so, so you don't use dead people or sexy people or dope sniffing dogs. <laughs> um, the other way of developing it, and this this particular way of developing it is is effective in um, a couple of ways. One is for developing samadhi. You can actually go into jhana uh, using this method. The other advantage is overcoming defilements. Like if you find yourself full of anger, then you should do metta. It'll clear your anger. You know? If you find yourself very envious, then you should do medita. It'll clear that. Right? So it overcomes defilements. Um, the, <coughs> the other method is what they call general pervasion. And uh, in that method, you start again with yourself, and then you extend it out in increasing circles. So if we were doing it now in, a, in this group, we'd say, uh, may I be well and happy? And then I would think, may all these people sitting here in this circle be well and happy? Then I'd extend it out. May all the people in the um, Rockaway neighborhood be well and happy, and all the people in New York City be well and happy, and keep extending it out in increasing circles until you have the whole world and then the whole universe. Extend, extend it uh, to infinity of space. May all the beings in all directions be well and happy. And you hold that for, that's the mature meditation, you're imagining radiating metta from your heart center out to the whole universe. That's a very powerful meditation for dispelling negative states of mind, the dark dark states of mind, if you're depressed or just, you know, dull and negative. You, you do this meditation and it blows out the cobwebs. It's a very powerful meditation. Um, I recommend if you do this, that uh, uh, before you break the meditation, you bring it back. You can do this much more quickly, but you know, from infinity, you know, this earth, this continent, this city, this this womb, me. You know, you bring it back in, so that you ground yourself again. You know, sort of emerge from the meditation, and you're out in Alpha Centauri <laughs> and ground yourself and be um, uh, you know, back to, to this uh, existence. Um, so those, those three meditations are all developed in the same way. The fourth one is Upeka, which is, uh, transcends the others. It's, a, it's considered a higher state of mind. And um, if you check the Vasudhimaga, which is the um, uh, classic meditation manual in Theravada, written in the Middle Ages in Sri Lanka, it treats Upeka as a kind of a graduate school. Like you have to have to perfection one of the others before you take up Upeka. I think that's a bit um, off-putting. I don't think you have to wait. You know, you can, it is more subtle, it's more difficult. Because Upeka is equanimity. It's, uh, and there's no wish associated, no aspiration associated with it. The others, may the beings be well and happy, may they be free of suffering, may they continue to enjoy the good fortune they have attained. This one is just recognizing the universality of beings. You know, there's, there's many, many ways in which beings differ from one another. There's uh, human beings, animals, uh, all sorts of beings, and 
every individual person is different. But uh, there are certain intrinsic, very intrinsic qualities that are universal, that are the same for every being. Uh, the traditional contemplation is to recognize all beings are subject of their karma. And that's a bit abstract and sort of dry. Uh, that's the traditional one. There's one that um, I first, I, I may have been invented by him. I first heard it uh, from um, a talk the Dalai Lama gave that I thought was quite, quite approachable for, for developing equanimity. He says, to recognize uh, this being just wants happiness, doesn't want suffering. So this is a, something that no matter how different a being might be from yourself or from one another, this is a universal. Every being just wants to be happy, they don't want to suffer. And you can recognize that and see that quality is universal. Um, <clears throat> So I found that um, that's a good contemplation if you're uh, in a in a crowded place. You're, you're on the you're on the subway here, or you're you're um, on a busy street, and you can just sort of look at people's faces and just think, this being just wants happiness, doesn't want suffering. You know, recognize that to cut through any judgment that immediately you like this kind of person, you don't like that, you just cut through it all and they're all the same in this regard. They all want happiness, don't want suffering. There's another kind of more uh, playful version of that that um, one of my teachers many years ago used to tell people that I, is uh, when, you're, when you're seeing a crowd of people, you, you kind of you do this little mantra to yourself. Um, here a Buddha, there a Buddha, everywhere a Buddha, Buddha. I'm a Buddha, you're a Buddha, everyone's a Buddha, Buddha. <laughs> Recognizing the, kind of the inherent um, potential for enlightenment in all beings. So these, uh, these states, all four of these states, we, we call them the Brahma Viharas, um, and they have many, many benefits developing Brahma Viharas. There's a list, and I won't remember them all now because it's a fairly long list, but there's a list of benefits of developing uh, Brahma Viharas. And, um, there's one, uh, uh, one uh, lives at ease, one is free of anger and ill will. Um, one becomes dear to human beings and to non-human beings. Um, one uh, sleeps easily, wakes easily, and dreams no evil dreams. Uh, when one comes to die, one dies unconfused. So you know, there's many benefits of developing um, developing these states, and they do uh, have a real effect on your life and, you know, in how, and relating to other other people and how other people relate to you. If you're coming from the Brahma Viharas, if you're based in those states, then you're projecting that. People pick up on that. And it, um, it uh, quells any hostility coming your way. And if you're, if you're perfect in it, then uh, you're immune from any kind of harm. You know, it's a very high level, but it's like um, a Buddha or an Arahant. Uh, no one would would hurt them or attack them because they're you know they're radiating this pure metta. So they, there's nothing for any hostility coming their way to catch on. And uh, and you'll you'll I think if you if you develop these meditations, you'll see that improvement in in your life and your in the way other people relate to you. And, you know, you'll see that. If you're coming from compassion and kindness and uh, metta, then uh, people feel that, and they, you know, even the most hostile kind of person is softened by that, um, that, that the effect of that.
So um, I think I'll stop there with the remarks and go, you know, with a bit more open discussion, question and answers. Yes. You, you mentioned uh, this word, samadhi. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, samadhi is um, a quality of mind that's defined as uh, stability or stillness, and is a, a meditation um, quality. It's when you're able to hold an object and not waver from it. So uh, your mind's not want, it's the opposite of having a wandering mind, daydreaming, you know, your mind is stable, it's holding an object and it's not shaken from that. So if you do with your mind, you mean a, a, an actual physical object, not paying attention to it. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be a physical object. There are. I mean, there are some meditations where you use a physical object. They call that casino meditation, where you have a, like a disc, a mm -hmm. colored disc, or, or, or something like that, and focus on it. Okay. Uh, uh, more often, we use like the breath. That's um, you know, use the physical sensation of breathing. In this particular topic this evening, it's an emotional state. Is the object. So like metta is this feeling of benevolence, of loving kindness. It's the emotional state is the object, and you're holding that as, as the object of your mind. You made a distinction that I wanted to ask about, but the, the way you phrased it has slipped my mind a little bit. I think you made a distinction like, between sort of feeling um, sympathetic compassion, mm -hmm. but I think between that and maybe vicariously experiencing the joy, and one being yeah. more um, something to 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 strive for, and one being something to be aware of. Well, it's it's not really that it's so negative, but it's not perfect. It's not they, these they they have each of these states that they call a near enemy and a far enemy. Right. And the far end is completely to be avoided. It's something like it's sure. inimical to your spiritual life altogether. But the, the near enemy is something that's sort of mm. on, you know, it's in that area, but it's not right. You haven't got it right. So, um, you know, for compassion, it's uh, if you see somebody suffering and you, uh, you feel, that makes you feel sad, mm -hmm. then you're not, you don't have the perfect karuna. Mm -hmm. Picking up, you're picking up secondhand suffering. So, uh, one way to think of that is that the whole point of Buddhism is to relieve, to re to make an end of suffering. Mm -hmm. And if you pick up vicarious suffering, you're just adding to the total sum total of suffering in the universe. You're not reducing it. Mm -hmm. That, for some, well, for maybe an obvious reason, is easier to understand than. I think you were also saying, but likewise, you wouldn't yeah, want to pick curious. up the joy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can feel joyous when you see, like, you see your friend on a fancy elephant. You feel <laughs> <laughs> you can feel that. Woo. Yeah, yeah. Yes. but you don't. But the it's the the near enemy there is the vicarious joys. Well, you would, then you would like you imagine yourself. You, it turns into a fantasy. You imagine mm -hmm. yourself on the elephant. Mm -hmm. No, that's not mm -hmm. doing it right. Well, it, it sounds like it might may even be like I'm being dependent on somebody. You're going to be happy if they're happy. You're going to be sad if they're yeah. sad. And yeah. that's, you're trying to be a little, have your own happiness. And, yes, yeah, that's a good you know. point, too. Yeah. That's a good general rule that is you, you are responsible for your own mind states. How would you go about doing meditation like on, on Metta? 
are on, on any of these dates? Do you repeat something, or is it something you just focus on the idea? Um, well, this, like I, I said, there's there are different ways to do it. It depends on whatever works for you to bring that feeling up. It's the feeling that's the actual object, but um, most most probably the most common way is to use a, a mix of um, verbal recitation and uh, visualization. Oh, right, okay. Right, so, okay, may I be well and happy, may everyone here be well and happy, and then, um, like when I do it, I like to visualize the radiation from my heart, you know, like the metta as a radiation going out and spreading out to the universe. Spell the meta? Uh, M E T T A. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, is it too simplistic to think you know? Because like there's people when you say everybody, it's got to be everybody. Uh, yeah. Is it too simplistic to think that if they're happy, then they won't be bad people? Yeah, that's... They that's, be yeah, that's... <laughs> you're not trying to judge whether they're good or bad, either. You're, you know, you should have um, metta for bad people, too. So, that's what I mean. That's what I stumbled on. Yeah, it's like I said about like, the scorpions. I have, you know, metta for this, for evildoers, but I don't want them to be around. You know, I don't want them here in, in the room with me, but may they be well and happy. May they not suffer. Because they, uh, they're making, one, one contemplation is someone who's doing evil deeds, they're making very terrible bad karma for themselves and they're going to have great suffering in the future. So that should arouse your compassion. Based on what you said, it seems, I assume that for when you're conceiving of like your enemy or someone you hate, it's okay if they're not someone you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it might be more immediately effective if it's someone, someone like say somebody at work that's always grouchy to you, mm -hmm. you know. But you can also use like an, an abstract person who's, you know, um, some, someone from the news or whatever. Mm -hmm. Just anybody. Yeah. So I have a question. So you want to what about the situation where you have a challenging event or a shocking event at the moment at the hit of the bottom? Would you practice meta at that point? Because the emotions are so fast that Yeah. Well if that's that's where the test of your practice comes in when there's some crisis situation. So you if if you haven't developed it in um, in more peaceful situation, you won't be able to find it when it comes to an emergency. You know, that's why we do it in when we sit down and do a meditation. It's basically an artificial situation we're setting up, a kind of an ideal space for our mind that we can develop these qualities. But then the test of how well you've done is when it comes up in the light some uh, uh, critical situation, am I still able to hold my myself in, you know, in peace and, and um, wisdom and metta? Okay. So could you uh, fall into a state of meditation at any point? Uh, say again. I'm, I'm could you fall into a state of meditation at any point, let's say if, if there's any sort of crisis? Yeah, or well, just the training about the buzz, right. Um, if you're very skillful, yes. I mean, that's theoretically possible. Uh, mm. yeah, I mean, right, because then everything is just coming and going. Yeah, coming it's much going. more. Of course, it's much more difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, this, this meditation. You required. wouldn't, and you wouldn't want to. If you're in a, a crisis situation and you have to act. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a, 
you know, totally absorb John Estate anyway. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if the house is burning down, we're sitting in meditating. Yeah, no, not, yeah. Not, <laughs> well, well they, okay, take that, take that example. Gonna, you know, the house, the house is burning down. Like, I'm not going to sit there and meditate. Right, yeah. <laughs> if the house is burning down, mm-hmm. if, you know, if you, if you don't have a controlled mind, you might panic. And just kind of do the wrong thing, run in the wrong direction, or get the wall and pass yeah, it, burn it. yeah. Get, but you know, if you if you if, you meditate, if you've developed a you know, good awareness and calm, and just, okay, house is burning, I got to get out of here, and mm-hmm. you just you know you, you do what needs to be done without getting excited. And, mm-hmm. you know. right. So if you haven't developed it fully, uh, if you haven't developed your metta and equanimity fully. Would you recommend, um, say, if you are um, like seeing someone being hurt or someone, um, I don't know, like a sort of, so to speak, triggering situation, do you think that the right uh, response would be to avoid getting into the situation altogether? So interacting with the with a person because you haven't um, yeah. reached the skill to... Well, that's where you need, you know, the quality of wisdom. As part of that is being realistic about situations. Like if you see something going on, you know, the first thing you have to determine in your mind is, can I actually do anything useful? Mm-hmm. Very often you can't, right? And if you're not skillful and you've got, you, you might feel like some, oh, this is really bad, I should do something. And then you make it worse by meddling. But sometimes you, it's not like that. Sometimes you see, oh yeah, I can help. And then it's wise and compassionate to go in and, and help the situation, do something. So the first thing you need is wisdom to determine is, can I actually be effective here or not? And then if, if you can, then to act in a calm, collected way, do whatever needs to be done. Thank you. What advice could you give if you are uh, constantly uh, in an active situation where you can actually, within the activities that are going around, you can actually sit there and just sort of concentrate on something, I guess. To, I mean, I guess it's good to close your eyes or maybe it's good to, to quiet, quiet the brain. Yeah, quiet the mind, but everything's going on. So, what advice could you give in terms of how you could quiet the brain, the mind, um, or have you? Do you meditate? Have you meditated in these sorts of? Um, well, it depends how you define meditation. Like, mm-hmm. um, you know, we tend to have a narrow idea of meditation when you sit down and mm-hmm. you know, do a formal exercise, but if. if uh, You know, if you get um, some skill in the mind, then there's, there's less distinction between meditating and not meditating. Mm-hmm. You, when you're in in an active situation, you're not you're not you can't have that kind of deep samadhi of, of holding one object, but you can be com- you can be aware, mindful, and calm, and and that then you're effective in your action. Mm-hmm. You're not kind of just getting panicky and just reacting but well, you're yeah. coming from clear wisdom and acting properly mm-hmm. yeah. I, yeah I, I from a, I guess from a state mm-hmm. point uh, of of some sort of crisis I'm not speaking about a crisis I'm speaking about on an everyday regular yeah. basis yeah. because I guess when we do get to a crisis since we are well since we or I might actively uh, uh, concentrate or meditating on that active country, but act, I might actively practice meditating while going to work on a train. Yeah. Or yeah. or on a bus. Or, yeah. you know, if I'm not driving, I'm not meditating, obviously. I mean, if I'm driving, I'm not meditating. Well, you, or, when or, you're or driving. you drive and well, you, wouldn't, well. you wouldn't, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't, drive you wouldn't meditate in that formal way, but, right. but right. if, if you're driving, mm-hmm. and you, uh, um, you're, and you're just driving, right? There's, when you're driving, just drive. You know, that's a form mm-hmm. of meditation. 
right? You're, you're, so you're not, you're not, um, you're paying attention to the, you know, if you're a good driver, you're paying attention to the road, you're, you're, you're checking your, your side view, you're, you know, you're, you're there, with, you're, you're doing what you're doing, you're not daydreaming, you're not wandering around with your mind and, you know, you're paying attention to what you're doing, then that's that's a form of meditation. Yeah, right. you do whatever you do. If you if you um, focus your mind on the task at hand, you'll do it better, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a that's a form of meditation. And some some traditions they make uh, like in Zen, they do um, some teachings around practical skills, like they have uh, archery and uh, calligraphy. Are examples they use a lot, right? So you you learn how to make these Japanese characters perfectly, and they, and this is an exercise of you know, having the mind focus on what it's doing. So whatever task you take up, whether you're building something or cooking or driving, or what, then if your mind is with it, and you're paying attention to detail, and you're clear, then that becomes a kind of meditation and you do the thing better, you do it perfectly. So it's almost, uh, let's take the activity of dancing. Yeah. Is that a form of meditation? It I can. mean, not dancing with a group of people, but let's say... Yeah, I, well, we don't do it in our tradition, but there is some, there are some traditions that use dancing, like uh, Sufis. Sufis. They, they have like a dancing as part of their practice and it's like a, a body meditation yes Sometimes you add more desire, and we kind of know that desire is cause of suffer. Yes. And uh, that's yeah. um, so, uh, and I realized that uh, you know uh, the last one, the Upeka, it's okay. it's really complex to understand. And I realize that if you missing the last one, try to just understand where the things are, and you are able to just develop all of those three things at the first one to be even more desire. Yeah. I can give you some example, like the past couple months, my 17-year-old cat has been sick, and I try to do all of those three things, and it's been up for desire for me, you know, that I want her to be healthy, happy, just stuff, mm -hmm. and it's actually, it's created more suffering, because that is not going to happen, and at the end, I have to tell, keep tell myself that, yeah, this is how it's the way things are. Yeah. And yeah. I, I still struggling with the fourth one to apply to all of that because of it's, it should be the way that we practice for the whole thing. So is there any recommendation that uh, or any further information for that? Yeah, I, I, know, I know what you're talking about. Um, and that is the case that Upeka, the fourth one, is higher, it transcends the others because there's still, with the others, there's still, um, as you say, some desire. There's still mm -hmm. some yeah, exactly. some uh, wish into mm -hmm. things to be different. And uh, so there, there's a limit to how far those states can go. You know, that um, by themselves, they don't lead to full liberation, but Upeka can open up the mind to, you know. It's really difficult. But it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's harder to do for, you know, properly, it's harder to have that stated. It does transcend the other three. It's a higher, considered to be a higher state of mind than the other three. Um, but it's all, these are, it's important to remember these are relative, you know, when we say higher and lower states, like uh, having metta 
or karuna for your sick cat is you know, way better than just being indifferent, you know, uh, callous about it. You, know, you have this, but then it, it's even superior if you have opaque on it. You know, this is just the nature of, of an old cat. We'll, we'll have these. So, how do I do meditate to focus on the fourth one? Because there's not so many. Yeah, um, you just have to bring it up in the mind by by a reflection. So it's not like a, the other ones are like an aspiration. This one is just a reflection. This is, this is just the nature of things. This is the way it is. The cat is suffering. That's the way it is. There's nothing can be done about it. This is just nature. And bring your mind to that that state of evenness. Sometimes you kind of have conflict between able to have dual state of mind and sometimes it's a subtle difference from ignoring. Yeah, oh yeah. So, so yeah. it's like it's so tiny detail all of those yeah. things that we talk well, about. Well that's the, that's the, um, that's the near enemy of Upeka is indifference. Mm -hmm. And we talked about in Thailand, they would, Ajahn Chah would talk about what they call water buffalo equanimity. You don't want to have the equanimity of a water buffalo. You know, it's not like you, like a water buffalo is a, kind of dull and stupid and it doesn't matter if it's raining or it's hot or flies are biting it, it's just sort of there, you know. But it's not because it's so wise, but it's because it's, it's so dull, right? And you don't want to be like that. You want, you want to be fully awake and aware but not affected, nothing. Equanimity means nothing shapes your mind. It's unshakable. You have perfect equanimity. Whatever happens, your mind is still in the same state of, of clarity and calm. If you leave all three because you focus on Ubeka and you just because you already accept like oh it's gonna be that way, you accept the nature of what it's gonna be. If once you accept it, can you just forget all the first three? And because because you already know that it's gonna happen anyway. You just yeah. do your best in first three and you just jump to the Yeah. Um I wouldn't quite put it like that because when you, I think you, when you're, um, when you're contemplating in the quiet of your own mind, yeah, you can just rest in opegas, it would be the highest state, but when you're dealing with other people and other animals and persons, beings of all kinds in the world, then you have to try and come from you have to try and have these, you know, the, the other Brahma Vihara is So activated. you have to have the first three as the base, but once yeah. you cannot control it anymore, you just go down to the fourth one. Yeah, correct? yeah, that would, yeah. So once at the end, you just have to accept the way, the yes. nature, yes. you cannot force it. Yeah. So that's like the late, the, yeah. the last stage. Yes. There's a, there's a neat um, set of uh, examples from one of the texts. This, the, the relationship of um, a mother to her child. When the baby is, is very young, it's first born, um, you have a metta for it. You just wish it be well. It's just a pure feeling of well, wish, well wishing. And then it's a little older and it starts to walk and it's always falling down and banging its knees. And then you have karuna. And then uh, when it's um, gets, gets 
older yet and it's going off to school, it's learning stuff, then you have Mudita, you're feeling happy when it's get a good report card, you have success in sports, you know. You're, and then when they're, they're grown up and moved out of the house and got their own life, then you have Mudita. <laughs> <laughs> see them as, as so much of a continuum, they're discrete states, but then the, there's the first three and Pekka are on a different level, they're not, you know, they're not the same, but the first three, they're all, they're all variations on, uh, on a theme, uh, and it's not like one is better than the other, or they're, they're all equal, but they have like different functions. Variations on the idea of of well wishing somehow. Is that what answer what you were asking? Or? Sort of. Like my wondering is if of the realm of possible thought spaces that we can yeah. exist in, you have you know the set of well wishing, yeah. but whether or not categorizations that they got or the categorizations that get created or just meant to limit our set of oh, you yeah. try to encapsulate some of the yeah um, I think those are broad enough categories that they they catch within them yeah. you know any kind of positive state I mean there'd be subtle variations of all kinds um, there is this teaching that the wise person always dwells in the realm of the hearts, meaning, meaning that you know, those are the emotional states that are really spiritually positive, and uh, anything outside of that is there's going is going to be more or less problematic. First one, metta is like general, and then karuna focuses on suffering, maybe not suffer, and then medita focuses on uh, uh, happiness, and maybe maybe continue to be happy. Uh, and the opaka just recognizes beings don't like to suffer; they do like to be happy. Just rec recognizes that without wishing to change it. 